right, everybody. Sorry for the delay in our start today. We've had a bit of a tech glitch, uh, thanks to Facebook changing the way that they're doing uh, streaming. So uh, we appreciate your patience. Um, I promise you it's very much anticipated what we're talking about today. Um, so a reminder, this is uh, the art of estate planning. We're talking about um, one of the topics um, uh, illiquid assets in SMSFs. Um, we've been so, so um, lucky to get David Lund join us today um, to present um, about this topic. David is a financial advisor um, and uh, at the very base of it, um, I, I see from the discussions I've had with David, he's very passionate about this space. Um, and um, he's done that through being a director and founder at Lifestyle Wealth Partners. Um, and uh, he definitely knows what he's talking about. He's an accredited specialist of the SMSF Association and um, offers an array of services that support um, his vision for, for clients and their estate planning. David, tell us a little bit about the services that you offer. We run a normal financial planning firm, investment, super, personal insurances, portfolio management, asset allocation, specialised in SMSFs as well. Probably what set us apart 20 years ago was taking on the role of CIO for families, the chief investment officer role. So we get involved in structuring, um, tax planning, asset protection matters. We're not licensed accountants nor licensed uh, lawyers. So therefore, we always need to coordinate with co-professionals. But we act as sort of a project manager and can and work between those different professions because we have a reasonable degree of understanding of, of these areas. And in particular for our larger clients, the intergenerational wealth planning aspect is, is I think, a feature of our business that is definitely one of our strengths. <clears throat> we will work through with the client the control issues, the tax issues, the wealth transfer issues, the asset protection issues that they need to consider when they're con uh, constructing their estate plan, which is, is everyone on this um, a broadcast will understand is is much more than just a will. Um, and then what the, I think the other thing that we do, I think that does work quite well and is very much appreciated by our clients is we get the children in, normally just the blood children, not the, not the spouses of the next generation, and explain to them all of the complexities that's involved with the estate plan that we've put to their parents and that the parents have signed off on so that if they're unhappy with any of it, they don't get to yell at a headstone for the problems that are there, um, they can actually discuss it with their parents. And we found it to be immensely successful, but it also, it puts us in a wonderful position because we see our clients two or more times a year that are in that space. We understand their families and know their family situations very, very well. So we can actually actively support the lawyers and the accountants who may have many more clients than we do and may not know the clients as well as we do. So we, we sort of sit in that middle ground between us and the other professionals coordinating everything. Um, and um, frankly, it's a, it's a place of honour. Carrie, I think you're muted. Talking to myself. Um, so I, th I think this shows, David, why this topic is something that's so great for you to present on, because I imagine this is something that has to be dealt with collaboratively when we think about it, um, given the issues associated with it. Now, David, I think from my understanding is you're going to be working through some different case examples as well, that sort of thing. So without sort of further ado, as they say, I'll, I'll let you get on and, and show, us, show us all about it. Sure. Thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, just briefly, um, I, I probably don't need to define illiquid assets or what events are likely to cause them too much, but I'll just cover those off very, very quickly. I'll spend a lot more time um, with in relation to the strategic alternatives. Um, for those of you who don't like numbers, I'm sorry, I've put some numbers in, but I'm a numbers guy, I can't help myself. But I also think it, it sort of brings the examples to life a little bit and, and hopefully will assist um, in, what I, in the messages that I'm trying to get across. Winston Churchill said, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, but the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. Um, if you're ever in need of a good quote, I can always recommend Winston. He had, he's got a lot of really good ones. And I think this is a case that, yes, there can be a lot of problems in this area, but you can actually achieve some pretty positive results for clients as well um, if you approach it with an open mindset and then collaborate with some with some really skilled and professional uh, co-professionals to, to, to get the best result for clients. The big one will be property, obviously, in terms of what illiquid assets are, but there are a lot of other ones as well that crop up. Uh, you'll be surprised what you find in super funds sometimes when you actually go through the balance sheets of funds. 
unlisted assets, so that can be private equity or even unlisted property at times. Um, collectibles, frozen assets, not so many of those these days, but particularly in the post GST, uh, GFC world, global financial crisis world, a lot of funds had frozen up that were otherwise liquid and became frozen. And so they are technically a liquid now, even though when you bought them, they weren't. Um, unique assets, and then even things like rights, licenses, and patents that are, are there as well. So there's there's a range of um, unlisted assets that, that that can become quite a liquid that are that are outside what we would normally think of, which is which is the property. Uh, events that can cause Ill illiquidity problems for SMSFs. Well, obviously, when you're speaking to estate lawyers, death, of course. Um, unexpected expenses, special levies on properties. Um, Div 296, and for those that if you aren't aware uh, what Div 296 in the Income Tax Assessment Act, it's the proposed legislation around the $3 million um, additional tax for high balance super funds. Um, sometimes pension minimums. If you've got a 5% yielding property and a 6% minimum pension, you've got a cash flow problem. Um, obviously, divorce, um, changing legislation, Div 296 fills that as well. And if you have a commercial property that's not running a related business, uh, or if the business fails, you may have a vacancy issue, which also causes cash flow problems. As most of you are probably aware, when a, when a super fund's in pension phase, its, uh, it's after-tax performance is substantially better uh, than if it's in accumulation phase. But if you don't have the cash to pay the pension, um, that can cause a, a problem to keep it in that tax-free pension phase especially if you're going to sell it and have capital gains tax. So there's a there's a whole bunch of sort of converging tax factors that can come in over the top and, and cause it some additional concerns. What assets can be retained in a fund as death benefits? As again, most of you probably already know, it, it, it must be retained for the benefit of a tax and a super beneficiary, uh, which basically means adult children are, are out unless they're uh, disabled or, or have other some kind of inter interdependency relationship, which the ATO is not being overly generous on these days. Um, the benefit has to be 100% retained in pension phase. So you can't retain a death benefit in accumulation phase. Um, and it needs to be at or below the recipient's transfer balance cap, assuming they're an adult, or that, that's typically a spouse. Uh, there is obviously child uh, death benefit pensions, but that's a, that's a, a presentation all upon itself. The death benefit must remain separate and distinguishable from the recipient's superannuation interests. So the recipient or the surviving member of the spouse normally may have a pension or an accumulation account. They cannot be merged with any death benefits. They must retain their, their own uh, distinguished uh, pension in the account, remembering you can't hold death benefits uh, in, in accumulation in the longer term. Uh, you can, however, and this is something that some of you may not be aware of, if you do have transfer balance cap issues, TBC issues, um, you can, before you revert the death benefit pension to the recipient, you, you, you could potentially uh, commute the recipient's pension back to accumulation. That will create space in the, in the, under the transfer balance cap rules so that a bigger death benefit pension can be paid through to the member. And uh, I've, I've got that in one of the worked examples. Um, uh, therefore, it, it, anything in excess of the transfer balance cap, whether it's uh, to a, a child under a death benefit pension or to a spouse, must be cashed. And that's because you can only have a pension up to the transfer balance cap um, or, or um, yeah, the, re the rest must be cashed after that. And so that's something to bear in mind as well. And that's where obviously a liquid asset start to create a problem. So in general, there's the, it, the options are not rocket science. It's the execution that's the tricky bit. So obviously sale may not be an ideal outcome, especially if there's an ongoing business being run in the property or where it's, uh, things of that nature. We can look at in-species transfers. We can look at related party sales. Uh, we can restructure the member benefits and the pensions. We can add new members. And, and we can also create some non-super insurance. Um, there are ways to put super in, uh, inside, um, uh, put insurance, sorry, inside super. That is something that is generally regarded as a no-no. There are some lawyers and some fairly well-credentialed lawyers that believe they've found a way. I haven't explored that with them to this point because I haven't had the case 
that required it, but it is somewhere that is legislatively quite dangerous because you've got sole purpose test concerns from the ATO. We'll start with selling assets. It's fairly straightforward. Um, capital gains tax, if it's a related party sale, you might have stamp duty. Um, if it's business real property for a, an ongoing business, you, you lose control of the asset, which is sometimes quite important. So you might need to think about maybe drawing up some appropriately long-term leases um, to protect the operation of the, of the business that's in the real property if you are going to sell it to an unrelated third party. Um, if you do sell it to uh, uh, someone who's not a non-third party, uh, Section 66 of the CIS Act prevents acquisition of assets by a related party but does not have a restriction on disposal. So you can actually sell to anybody and anything. Um, it still has to comply with Section 109, which is it must be on an arm's length basis. Uh, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, especially in, re in relation to valuations, because that's crucial that you get that bit right. Also, to a sale doesn't have to be 100% of the asset. Um, tenants in common or TIC is something that you can do. So we can sell part of the asset. That will obviously mitigate uh, acquisition stamp duty, CGT, if there is any on sale. Um, but it is a little bit messy to administer. Again, it can be done. You need to be on the front foot with the administration because it can get pretty messy pretty quickly. Uh, and because it's a superannuation asset, uh, there's a whole load of other rules that then come in over the top that could cause other problems that wouldn't necessarily occur to you in the first instance that might be a compliance problem for the SMSF. Further, at least in New South Wales, for a series of non-contracted disposals of more than 13 months, you can actually reset the stamp duty clock and um, transfer portions of the assets at lower values um, because you're only transferring a portion of the asset and utilise the tax-free and the lower, lower stamp duty rate levels. Again, it's administratively a little bit messy. You probably wouldn't do it just for that reason. You'd probably do it in conjunction with another strategy as for the acquisitors to be building assets or paying off debt so that they create more headroom to do it. But I know it works in New South Wales. You'd have to check the relevant jurisdiction if it's not in New South Wales. I think Victoria is a bit more um, collectivist in the way they approach the stamp duty um, uh, in Victoria. Other states, I'm not so sure. I'm sorry. So I'll give you an example. Um, for those of you that are old enough to remember Greece, I Googled it this morning and was shocked to see it was the movie was released in 1978. Um, but Danny is uh, 60, 61 years old. He has a member's account of $3.1 million. He has $1.8 million in pension phase. Sandy, who's 58 year old, has a member's benefit of $750,000 in accumulation and she has retired. But because of her age, she hasn't met a full condition of release yet. The assets supporting the members' benefits is a business real property, $3 million with a net yield of 5%, securities of $600,000 and $250,000 in cash. The son Vito runs a mechanics business called Grease Lightning in the business real property. And unfortunately, Danny has just died. So the first option um, is that, um, well, the first issue we have is we have to pay $1.2 million out of super. Even if we revert the full $1.9 million pension to Sandy, remembering that death benefits can only be retained in pension phase, we will still have an excess member's benefit of $1.2 million. So no matter what we do, no matter what happens, $1.2 million has to come out of this fund. We've got maybe $800,000 in cash and securities, leaving us a small 50K liquidity buffer in our example. And Vito can maybe purchase $400,000 himself um, by, or in his own name or family trust or something like that. The benefits of this kind of strategy is that the CGT stamp duty is kept low due to the small transaction value. The family control of the asset is retained, remembering that Vito runs the family business um, out of the property. Um, maximum value is kept in a low tax environment, which is the SMSF, being either a 0% tax rate for the $1.9 million death benefit pension for Sandy, and the rest of the income is taxed at 15% and CGT most probably mostly 10%. Uh, despite Sandy being less than 60, the pension income is not taxable, um, as uh, this is on the 1.9 million, as the death benefit provided to a tax dependent from Danny, he was greater than 60 years old at the time of death. So that, that pension income is not accessible to Sandy, which means she has full access 
to her other normal income tax scales of zero and then the low low rates of taxation for, for lower income earners uh, is fully available to her and the pension income does not impact that at all. And it gives Vito time to contribute and or grow his super so that he can take an increasing interest in the property. There are a lot of downsides though with this strategy. Uh, the SMSF, we're now operating a business real properties tenants in common. And as I said, it's doable, but it's messy. Uh, and this is more from an accounting and administration perspective, not really from a legal perspective. We may have a liquidity squeeze on the fund. Remembering we only left $50,000 cash in there. And if there are additional unexpected expenses, land tax repairs, and even as Sandy gets older, the pension minimums will go up. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, uh, uh, account-based pension minimums are age-based in percentage terms and assessed on the June 30 balance of the pension. So as she gets older, those pension minimums continue to go up and put increasing cash flow pressures on the fund. An increased amount of the income will be taxable. Uh, we have further cash flow issues, as I said, as Sandy ages. Um, further sales to veto will probably be required in the future to maintain fund liquidity, but because we've only done a small amount in the first instance, it will give veto time to acquire that extra liquidity or develop that extra liquidity. We do have significant issues if Sandy dies uh, because we because we don't have any, uh, we have superannuation dependents, say in Vito and his siblings, we will likely not have any tax dependents, which means the entirety of the death benefit pension, the 1.9 million has to come out, but also so does uh, Sandy's accumulation money that we've left in accumulation that was her money, that also has to come out as well. Uh, Vito may struggle to improve the property with fund assets and possible compliance issues for the Greece SMSF as, uh, um, as, as Vito is a related party of Sandy and the related party rules are really quite extensive as who is a related party. And particularly when you have a child who is running a business, they think they're now the, let's just say the man of the family and they make all the decisions and mum doesn't understand and mum just has to understand. No, the son really needs to understand. He can't use the property security he can't store his personal assets there. He must pay market rent even when he doesn't want to. Um, and there's a whole bunch of risks that Vito can push onto Sandy and the compliance of Sandy's fund because he's not listening to mum or mum's advisors in relation to the compliance issues associated with having an SMSF in, in um, having a property, beg your pardon, inside an SMSF. Uh, David, um, I might just give you a course for break there for a minute. One of the questions that's come up around this concept of the selling assets is, um, you know, whether the asset has to be sold within a certain time frame of, of the person passing away. Uh, yes, that's um, that's how long is a piece of string question in certain circumstances. Now, notionally, it, it needs to be um, within within six months of death or the grant of probate um, as a as a starting point. Um, However, there are, uh, unless there are other extenuating circumstances. So if you have cash and securities, there's no reason that you shouldn't be complying with that requirement. If you have to renovate the property, you have to get council approval. Um, it, it, if you're getting to that sort of period where it's pushing out to say close to a year or more, I would be on the front foot with that, uh, approaching the ATO, maybe get a, a private ruling on what they recommend you do. Um, generally speaking, as much as government regulators irritate the hell out of me and most other people, when it comes to genuine attempts to deal with genuine issues with SMSFs, the ATO do a pretty good job. They, they, they don't say no, the rules, I mean, sometimes the rule does say and they don't give you any choice, but in cases like this, I think they'll be relatively flexible as long as they can see genuine commitment and genuine effort on behalf of all parties, especially the trustees of the fund, to execute their duties appropriately to comply with the law as best as they are able. Ultimately, if they believe that you're not getting there and you're not putting in sufficient effort, they can declare the fund as non-complying. That is another whole presentation worth of uh, material. Suffice it to say, you don't want to be paying 45% uh, tax on the fund assets, not the income, the fund assets. Uh, except uh, with the exclusion of the tax-free component, it's just not a place you want to go. So you want to be as cooperative and as supportive of the tax office directives as you possibly can and be on the front foot with communication if you are experiencing difficulties that are outside of your control. Yeah. 
Thanks, David. It's a question that comes up often. T Tara asked the question in the group, but I know there's a few people out there thinking it. Um, just in relation to this particular example, um, someone's asked, did Danny have a BDBN in place in this instance? And if so, what were the terms or was it left to the discretion of the trustee? Interestingly, I know a lot of accountants and quite a lot of lawyers stipulate BDBNs. Um, I actually try and avoid them. The place where I wouldn't avoid them is when you maybe have second marriages, children from second marriages, and you really want to absolutely control the streaming of assets because you've, you've got those issues to deal with. BDBNs make all the sense in the world in those cases. Generally speaking, for a what I would call a traditional nuclear family, mum and dad, they've been together forever. We don't have kids through other marriages. We don't have um, other likely claimants to the estate. We like to leave it up to the discretion of both the trustees and the executors, but then place a high degree of focus on who owns the shares in the trustee companies for the, the non-directly held assets. Are they held as joint tenants or tenants in common or are they individually owned? So that we make sure that at the time of death, that control goes to the people that you want, um, but also too that you protect maybe Vito's siblings in that space. So it's fine, it's Vito's business, we wanna give him control, but if it's partly now own, if, if it's now Vito and Mum in the SMSF, which I'll come to in a second, um, you know, Vito can, and we've all seen the cases where money gets stolen from siblings because one of the siblings gets into the SMSF and, and keeps the other children out or the executors out of the fund. David, yeah, no, I think um, obviously everything turns on facts at the time. Um, and certainly when it comes to SMSFs, it's something that we we have to think about, you know, blending that, you know, certainty versus flexibility of the outcome. So thanks, David. It is on a spectrum. Um, and I, I, I've, I've stolen the phrase from almost every legal presenter I've ever heard present. And they always say it depends. And that's exactly what this is. is it depends. Um, it's it's very, very individualistic. You cannot approach this, as everyone would know, uh, with a cookie cutter, from a cookie cutter perspective. Thanks, David. Are we okay to move on, Terry? Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks, David. Um, we can in-specie assets. Um, importantly, in-specie of assets is not counted as a pension payment. Um, pay pension payments must be made with um, cash. So one of the, the older strategies was we would in specie the pension minimum to say Sandy every year of the property. And in New South Wales, that was great because we didn't virtually didn't pay any stamp duty. Uh, we didn't put any cash flow burden on the fund. Um, and it was a really good strategy until the ATO said you're not allowed to do it anymore. Um, it, it will obviously attract uh, stamp duty and capital gains tax on the non-pension phase assets. But there's probably a little known part of this particularly if it's going to be a larger in-specie transfer, is that the timing in the year that you transfer it can have a tax impact on the fund. And this is something to, to sort of really bear in mind at, at the administration phase of the estate, is that ECPI or exempt current pension income is the taxable percentage of the fund. Um, uh, a very simple example is if we have $100,000 worth of income and your ECPI percentage is 50%, $50,000 is taxable income to the fund. And the ECPI percentage is, is calculated by an actuary. So one of the strategies that you can follow um, with due respect to the six months from probate uh, relating to that previous question that was asking about the sale, if we can do it early in the financial year, the, the sale, and get the funds out of super, what that effectively means is the super balance drops for the majority of the year, which means a, a time-weighted average of the fund will be hot more in pension phase. That will push up the ECPI percentage that the actuary will calculate at the end of the year. That higher ECPI percentage will mean more of the fund's income in that year is tax-free. And if you have triggered a CGT event on the accumulation phase assets within the fund, that will increase the percentage of that gain that is actually ends up being tax free. Um, it's not most people don't know about this or don't think about this, but it is really quite important. There is one other thing that is an absolute horrible hook that is not really related to illiquid assets, but it's very related to the timing in the year. Um, and it's not an ECPI issue, but so I just thought I'd chuck this in. It was a little bit out of scope. So hopefully Lara doesn't get too upset at me. Um, but particularly pre-99 unit trust, but if you own property in a unit trust, 
and especially if it's a pre-99 trust, it will have gone through the 20, uh, 2017 cost base uplift. That what happened in 2017, that's where transfer balance caps came from. Maximum one, it was 1.6 million in pension phase. It's now been indexed up to 1.9 million in pension phase. Because of the cost base uplift, again, you want to wind up a unit trust that holds a property in the same year that you sell the unit, the property inside the unit trust. The reason is, is because you, you actually can, you actually can reduce the CGT payable because you will wind up with a capital loss on the wind up of the units inside the super fund that can be offset against the CGT from the property that was sold inside the unit trust, but then distributed to the fund to pay tax on. This is quite complex and it, it's probably a bit much for a presentation like this. This is more just, you don't, necessarily need to understand the nuance that it's just this is just a red flag and if you see a unit trust being wound up because a property is being sold get some advice uh, get some very good advice on the timing of that and trying to ensure that the unit trust is wound up in the same year the consequence of not doing it is you end up paying more capital gains tax in the year of the disposal of the property and you get a carry forward loss in the fund that may or may not ever be realized and so you may be able to get the money back eventually, but it's it's definitely a suboptimal outcome for the client. So that's really just a, a red flag, something to stick in the back of your mind. If it comes up, just just remember to go ask someone about it in this space that's that's a specialist because it, it is it is quite a niche area. So we in species 50% of the property into a superannuation proceeds trust. Now I've got in brackets there not a TT. The reason being, of course, is that unless you have very strictly defined benef beneficiaries of a TT, essentially the beneficiaries of an SPT, uh, you do open up additional taxation. In the case of the SPT, assuming the only beneficiary is Sandy, Sandy will clearly be a tax and super beneficiary, that means the taxable component when it hits the trust will not be taxable and taxed at the estate level. Whereas if it goes into a regular TT that that might have Vito and his siblings as a as a beneficiary or potentially even a bucket company, we will have um, tax payable on the taxable component at the estate level. And worse, if there was any if if um, if Danny had any insurance uh, in super, then you're potentially looking upwards of of thirty percent taxation on that amount as well. So it, it can end up with very nasty taxation outcomes. So I'm really going to talk only to an SPT in this example, um, because, the, uh, because that is really the only viable trust that makes any sense, unless essentially the, the benefit is 100% tax-free component, in which case, or, or very low tax-free component, there may be other reasons. This is another, it depends. Even if you have maybe 10% taxable component, you may be willing to take the tax in the short term so that you have the much broader distributable uh, income opportunities, including to, um, um, you know, Vito's children, Sandy's grandchildren, and et cetera, that you all know about. Obviously, benefits control of the properties rent retained. Um, we retain the existing liquidity of 850000 inside the fund. Sandy still gets tax-free income, but the pension is now $1.6 million. That's $3.1 million minus the $1.5 million because it was 50% of the property. That's why the $1.5 Hence, she has 300,000 transfer balance cap headspace, which that's the difference between uh, the transfer balance cap of 1.9 and the pension we commence for 1.6, which means that assuming there's no more indexation, that when she does meet a condition of release um, uh, in the future, she then can convert some of her accumulation funds into pension phase on, on these numbers up to $300,000. Uh, we do have the ability um, uh, potentially to provide income to other family members. However, as I said, that it, that is really most likely only going to be Sandy um, unless we have um, uh, tax to other tax dependents that we can identify, which again can be on occasion, but is often rare in most, circum most circumstances. The downsides is we now have an SMSF and an SPT operating the BRP in the TIC. <laughs> Sorry for all the acronyms, but I've run out of uh, typing space otherwise. Yeah, so it's just the um, the tenants in common um, and we're operating the business real property across two entities. We've got high CGT and stamp duty. Uh, we may be able to minimize the CGT on the eCPI percentage, which I've already addressed. 
Uh, we do have issues if Sandy dies, but to a less, lesser extent than option one. We can we can talk about some new members. So Vito and uh, Nina, his wife, have a million dollars in super between them. They can roll that into the fund. Then the fund can cash the 1.2 out, uh, giving Sandy a $1.9 million pen pension uh, back towards strategy uh, option one. And then roll 200, uh, and then um, uh, not roll, sorry, that should say cash. Uh, the 200,000 from the fund in, in addition to meet our 1.2 million cash requirements um, from the fund. So we'll have $650,000 left um, uh, in liquid funds inside the fund. Fund liquidity will obviously therefore be maintained. Ongoing contributions, we'll have SGC contributions. We'll keep coming in and we'll help maintain liquidity. So we'll assist in the payment of Sandy's pensions. And that will necessarily mean that in percentage terms, the asset will slowly transfer over to, to Nina and, and uh, Vito. Um, there's no CGT or stamp duty because we haven't moved any property. Um, and we've got uh, simplified management because we've got no tenants in common assets uh, with, with the, in this particular case. The downsides, um, th this goes back to some of the case law that I, I can't remember all the case names, I must admit, but I do remember the principles about bringing children into the fund dis disputes with Vito's siblings because he is now a trustee. Um, and um, Sandy is a major asset owner, but, a min but she has minority control because we have three members. And if it's just a standard deed, then you're going to end up with Vito and Nina essentially controlling the fund, even though they don't have the majority of the assets in the fund. One of the considerations you can consider is a deed amendment in this case and change the, the voting rules so that it is based on a dollar weighted basis, not a a, um, a number a, a majority of directors basis, or, or, or there's, I'm sure there's other ways to skin the cat, but that's one of the easy ways to manage that. There's poor diversification for all, especially Nina and Vito. They've got a long-term investment in superannuation that's really hinging on the success or failure of one asset. Um, one, of, one of the principles that I always explain to clients is that if, if anything I ever say or do doesn't comply with the grandmother rule, then keep asking questions or leave. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that's exactly what Nina and Vito are doing. Essentially, there is some liquidity there, but they're essentially putting all their eggs in one basket. Um, there is possible questions for sole purpose tests. Now, a lot of people say, no, it's not. Everyone does it and da 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 They're kind of right, but the ATO still has keeps mumbling about it. They don't like assets, uh, uh, super funds that have single asset domination, and that's almost always business real property or, or real property at least anyway, or residential property as well, uh, because they don't believe it's necessarily for a sole and primary purpose, especially when you're running a business real property, even though there's specific exemptions for it. I think there's a reasonable degree of legislative risk there going forward as well. That being said, it's a very common strategy. I would recommend it to clients, but it's it's a very much it depends and it's only in exceptional circumstances. We do have a problem with Sandy dies. We've got a large superannuation benefit. Pretty much all the money has to come out um, and we're kind of back to where we started from, maybe back to option one, um, selling the asset. Um, another option for restructuring assets is that uh, Vito and his wife Nina have $1 million in super between them. They set up their own SMSF. They use a $1 million deposit and borrow $1.4 million under the LRBA. And then they make two triple ups um, in July 2024. Um, for those that don't know, the um, non-concessional contribution limits are being indexed on the 1st of July 2024. So that's a going from 110 per annum to 120. You can do a triple up, so that's 360. You can do two of those because there's Nina and Vito. That's where the 720 comes from. Uh, and they can purchase the, the property um, uh, from Greece SMSF at market value, $3 million. Uh, the property must be 100% BRP though, because it's a related party transaction. Uh, there, there can't be any, any non-business related properties because they're acquiring an asset from a related party. If there's a storage unit out the back or Vito stores his sports car in the back under a sheet, then we've got problems that it's not 100% BRP and it, and it will breach the uh, related party acquisition rules. From Sandy's perspective, fund liquidity is maximised, uh, and obviously not for Vito and Nina, but for, for Sandy it is. 
Um, simplified management, we've got no tenants in common assets. We've got separation between the generations of financial assets. So we reduce the risk of conflict with Vito siblings, especially when Sandy dies. And we've got longevity of ownership, reducing future stresses, especially if Sandy dies, because we'll have a fully liquid fund and that can be wound up and Vito can use his inheritance to help pay off the loan, et cetera, um, by making additional super contributions once he's passed his three years for his non-concessional contribution, et cetera. The downsides, obviously, maximise the CGT and stamp duty. Um, poor, poor diversification, that, that's really Nina and Vito. Uh, it may, it's even worse than the previous example because all they own in super is, is the property. They don't have any liquids at all when they start. It must have a comprehensive, a comprehensive valuation and a letter from a real estate agent is basically not good enough. You need to have a proper valuation. Valuations are getting quite expensive. Uh, there are some independent groups that are popping up that are offering a much more cost effective service. Um, and we are in the process of reviewing some of those at the moment for use with our funds for when we need them. Uh, but yeah, a letter from a real estate agent or a trustee valuation doesn't cut it. And you definitely want to st stay away from NALI and NALI. That's non arm's length expenses and non arm's length income. It, that's a that's probably two presentations um, and you don't, you just don't want to go anywhere near either of those. Um, and we, we're increasing the sole purpose test section 62. Like I said, a lot of people will say it's fine uh, and it probably will be, but you do have increased legislative risk with this strategy for, for Nina and Vito. Other asset options, as I said, it's not just all about property and I know I haven't got to LRBAs, but patience that's coming. Um, we have unlisted assets, like I mentioned, collectibles, frozen assets, unique assets, and rights, licenses, or patents. Unlisted is probably the easiest valuation because it's normally done by a third party. Um, the remaining assets have significant challenges and making sure we stay clear of section 109 because typically what you do with these things is you move them out, uh, but you have to move them out at market valuations. Um, and it's, it's getting valuations on some of these things um, is they are going to be difficult to value and sometimes expensive and finding the right people to do the valuations for you are going to be a challenge. Um, but it, it's very much dependent on the type of assets you're trying to move out. But some people put some amazing things in their fund. David, I, just to give you a bit of a, a break to catch your breath, um, I know someone that had coins in theirs and um, coins considered a collectible. And the problem was, is that there was no record of what they had acquired the coins from, as, so they had no, you know, a way to calculate that cost base. Um, and then finding people that could actually get the data on it was also hard again. So then you couldn't have, you know, then you had issues with valuation as well. So they, are, they have their own unique issues. Um, it's actually worse than that too. Like a, a similar example might be artwork. So mm -hmm. artwork, collectible cars, those sorts of things. You have significant sole purpose test issues on an ongoing basis, whether people are dying or not, um, mm -hmm. because um, um, th there is arguably a purpose that is not the sole and primary purpose for the provision of retirement benefits, which is the basis of the sole purpose test. And that is, you like art or you like collecting coins or I love driving my car. Uh, I'll give you an example. Someone, was, someone had, had a client that had a car in the fund um, they had to have it garaged separately and paid for separately. Under the vintage car registration rules, they had to, um, they could only drive it a certain number of kilometres, but it had to be serviced and it had to be driven to be maintained. They were not allowed to drive the car. They were not allowed to be a passenger in the car whilst it was being driven because they were getting a benefit other than a stolen primary purpose of a retirement benefit because they were getting the benefit of they like to collect old cars. So you can't hang the picture on your wall. You can't put it in your safe at home. It's got to be separately stored. You maybe, if you're lucky, be able to rent it out and hang it on a wall in a, at a business or something. They are the sort of assets you just go, you know what, just keep it out of your fund. Um, yeah. unless, unless it, because it just causes lots of problems. Unless you are incredibly disciplined and your client is very disciplined. And unlike another case I found, they put some wine in the fund, which was great, but then they got, they got a bit tipsy one night and opened a few of the bottles and drank them. So... <laughs> <laughs> and, they like weren't, an and they weren't in pension phase. So. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I've got another question, but I'll let you keep going. This one month we might sort of use as a bit of summary in the end. Okay. Um, now, if there if there's an LRBA, often the, uh, there's only one option. 
sell. The, as I've already explained, the, um, the cash flow squeeze becomes extreme when you have an LRBA in, in place. And that is because, because you can only re retain death benefits in a fund in pension phase, you must pay out the pension. If you don't pay out the pension, you have to go into accumulation phase, which is an option, but it does increase the tax payable by the fund because when we're now paying income tax at 15%, not 0%, on the, on the pension assets. But if it's a death benefit, it has to be cashed out because you can't retain it in the accumulation phase. So you, you sort of really get stuck between a rock and a hard place and the funding becomes that much. You, you saw the difficulties in funding with the example that I provided. The LRBA just puts bells on it and makes it so much more complex. Um, uh, that's just recapping that the death benefits and super benefits must be retained. And in the case of an existing LRBA, having that cash flow to fund the pension payments, the debt repayments is a massive challenge. And there are very limited examples of where it can be retained. Most likely only if the member's balance is not high and maybe you have insurance in place. But there, like I said, there's an issue with holding insurance inside super, which I can't go into today. But the fundamental principle is if it's held over the benefit of Danny, who is the deceased, then it has to be credited to his member's account which only increases the amount that you pay up, have to pay out as a death benefit, so you can't repay the LRBA. So that's the problem that you, you end up with. Uh, again, it depends. There will be circumstances where it can work, but it's normally only when the numbers are smaller. So what to do? Um, the, the bank, when they find out that Danny has died, will probably call in the loan, um, and then refinancing is going to be an issue. The banks don't like LRBAs. Most of them are backed out except for very, very large LRBAs. Um, so therefore, you're normally working in the second tier market these days to try and get loans um, to try and refinance. So refinance maybe, but it's got its problems. We can consider life insurance outside of the fund. So there, as I said to you, it has to be credited to the member's account if it's inside super, but if it's outside super, it doesn't. So therefore, we could have a life policy, say, owned by Vito, um, but on the life of Danny. And if Danny dies, Vito gets the payout of the life insurance and then he can he, he will then have the funds to purchase a significant amount of the property, whether it's partially or and whether he does it through super or whether he does it through a, maybe his own unit trust or whatever he wants to do, discretionary family trust, uh, he, he may be able to do that. Um, a related party loan, it can be loaned internally but you do have to be careful. Again, we're back to arm's length arrangements. Um, uh, there are some safe harbour provisions that you can use for related party loans. That is also another complex area. And I'm sorry to say, yet another presentation could be done on that one. Um, but just I think the idea behind this is you keep this stuff in your head about what the options might be and then um, work on it from there. If you do end up following up with the SPT, the superannuation proceeds trust issue, you could actually use a related party loan there. But as you would all be aware, Section 102AG of ITAA 36 is that you'd lose your accepted minor income because you've increased the um, corpus of a testamentary trust effectively. So you won't be able to pay uh, minor children. But if it's an SPT, you probably can't anyway. So that, that might be a... Um, an option that you can look at in trying to manage the LRBA. Um, what not to do, as you've seen, because of the crossover with SMSF regulations, which are really quite onerous, especially in related party transactions, sole purpose test, arm's length transactions, you really, really need to know your stuff in this place or just work with somebody who, who does know their stuff. Um, and lawyers generally can't influence this very much, but I'm very much against residential real estate in an SMSF. I think it's a really, really bad idea. I can go into it uh, maybe offline if anyone's interested, but most trustees, and I'll call them punters, um, go into it completely blind. Um, there's lots of problems with resi and SMSFs, and it's generally often after bad or conflicted advice from accountants, brokers, and especially real estate agents and property developers. They just see it as another way to shift stock and, and they're not left to clean up the mess that residential property uh, creates inside super. People will always be able to throw out the, oh, I've got one or I know somebody who's got one and it works fine. Great for them. My answer is no. <laughs> um, we can... Um, 
Uh, we can't rely on trustee or other non-professional valuations. Again, letter from a real estate agent's uh, not going to pass muster, section 109. One of the things that I really want to emphasize um, is, is get your testators and SMSF trustees to get advice a long time before they die. It's fine to do the will. It's fine to do the, yeah, well, we'll see who's got control, but actually go through the scenario of some of the planning issues that I've been talking about well in advance of Danny dying in our example. Um, it, it is quite amazing the difference in the outcomes you can create for clients if you do that planning in advance whilst you're in the, at the stage of signing the will rather than when you're trying to lodge probate or just receive probate back from the Supreme Court. Um, I really can't emphasise that enough. And the strategic benefit you can create for clients is really, really quite significant. Um, sorry, Carrie. I, I was just going to ask, I think this is relevant to what you're talking about now. One of the questions that came up before was, you know, how would you discuss with clients where someone, where you believe someone has received bad SMSF advice? So the example given was blended family, husband and wife each have a child from separate relationships and they're kind of all in the fund and they bought a chunky asset, I think it was a property, and um, there's been some um, there's an understanding um, that they expect the property to be able to stay in the SMSF um, when when they pass away. Um, generally, when you've, because obviously estate planning as uh, uh, practitioners on, most of the practitioners on this uh, webcast know more than me, uh, sometimes people don't deal with death very well. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and, and any complex issue like this, I generally approach it from more of a, a, a an inquisitive approach initially. So what what would you like to have happen? What do you expect to happen? In, in an ideal world, what would you like to have happen? And then they say, oh, yeah, we want to stay in the fund. Um, you then go, well, this is, this is not, uh, we can't advise you formally on this, but my understanding is that the money will ha likely have to come out of super, especially when the second one of you passes. It, it, it is not allowed to stay in super except under exceptional circumstances. And this goes back to the point that I just made about getting planning advice um, and taxation advice and asset uh, um, structuring advice long before anyone rings the ambulance. Uh, because this is, this is where the mess really gets created because we're trying to recover from a bad situation, not preventing the bad situation from occurring in the first place. Because if you're proactive on these things, um, uh, what's, that, what's that old saying? An um, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Well, that's that's this one. There's another grandmother rule for you. Um, that it, it's, it's just making sure that you've thought through the strategies, you've queried it with the clients. I mean, it's what I do on the legal side. Is Look, I can't advise you on this, but this is my understanding let me ring XYZ lawyer. And this is where we go into the sort of the um, the project management piece is that we talk to the clients about let let us work out, tech, you, we've got a, a, an issue here that we need to work through, let us work it through together. And then we'll, then we'll both come back to you, but we'll both come back to you with exactly the same story. So the client's not, well, my lawyer said this and my accountant said this, they're being told exactly the same thing from all of their advisors because their advisors are actually working in a collaborative fashion for the benefit of the client. and. Uh, trust me, it, it's it's a big win for your business when the clients see that because they then want to super glue themselves to you. Yeah, I think I really like what you said at the start of the the conversation there, David, about you know t taking approaching it with an inquisitive mind. You know, asking the client, you know, what you know, tell me about this property, and, and you know, why did you purchase this property? Why is it important that you keep this property? Those sorts of things, and then you know, uh, building up a little bit of trust and a bit of commonality with the client, which then can lead into, um, you know, as I said, that that awkward conversation around this actually might not happen the way that you expect it to happen or this is my understanding the, the other the other thing that that fleshes out is that because you get to a point of understanding on their motivations and reasons um you say well okay that's great but if we do it this way you'll still get what you want but not necessarily the way you thought you wanted to do it or you were going to do it um i say to my clients all the time is that my uh, your your job is the what I want this and I don't want that. So you so you're the you're the captain of the ship. We're, we're just the navigator. So we're we're the how. So this is what you want. We we will tell you how to do it. Because particularly when you look at estate planning, 
taxation, asset protection, control, all of these issues that come across, the shortest distance between two points is more than often not a straight line. And therefore, you need to be very cognizant of um, all of those issues. And those issues need to be brought to the front of house in the client's mind. And this is where I think lawyers and accountants are, are at a disadvantage is because they have many more clients and they spend a lot less time per client with them than say maybe a planner gets the luxury of doing, they might not necessarily understand these deeper issues. But when you have these larger funds and these larger estates, you you, you really need to get to that level of understanding of, of, of not just the technical aspects of the estate plan, but what's in the hearts and the minds of your actual clients and do a bit of digging in that space to unearth some of those underlying motivations and underlying beliefs um, otherwise, you're likely to put together a plan that might actually end up blowing up for the family. And it's not through incompetence, it's just through lack of time and understanding the motivations of the client. Thanks, David. Have you got another slide? I've got one more question here, which we can take offline if we need to. I just sort of check I'll, where you're I'll, I'll finish. I'll finish in very, very quickly, and then um, we, we can finish with the last question, if that's okay. That's um, great. As I said to you, work through an intergenerational tax plan. Um, obviously, Mar and Park Kettle, if they die and they've got a super fund, um, we just wind it up. We're normally just paying off the kids' mortgages. So this is the, the intergenerational tax plan and wealth plan is is probably more related to your your larger families, um, where we will have residual wealth being transferred between the generations, and whether that's one generation, two generations, or three generations. And as I said, it's a control, tax, asset protection. It's 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 not just um, getting the trusts in place, um, and it's not just the case for liquid assets. Um, and if you're in doubt with anything in relation to the fund, I'd, I'd really encourage you to, to talk with the accountant to connect you with the auditor of the fund because you can take some of these issues to the auditor and say, look, we're doing this, we think this is okay. If we presented this in this format, are you okay with that from an audit perspective? Because they will either have to qualify the audit or not qualify the audit back to the tax office. So again, engaging with yet another professional being the auditor of the fund is something I would really strongly commend to people if they're directing trustees in the administration of an estate that involves an SMSF. And I got there, Carrie. So uh, yes, we can finish on that last question. Thanks, David. I appreciate you said that you might take this one offline. Um, and uh, it's one of our uh, valued members of our community has um, asked the question. So I thought maybe given we've got a few minutes as we started a little bit late, you might be able to just give a high level view of what the issues are. But sure. Angie's asked, you know, what are the issues that potentially com could come up with residential property owned in SMSF? Because you said before there's a problem and, and it's a, there's a long list without sort of tying you to a particular long sort of spiel about what all the detailed problems are. Do you have any high level comments about that? Yeah, it, it, that's really easy. I'll just give you a couple of very simple examples. Um, that uh, your typical, just think of a typical landlord, you know, they, you know, they, you may use an agent, you may not. Um, the tenant moves out, the owner's retired. Um, they might not have an ability to contribute to superannuation because of their age or their superannuation balance or other factors or their working status. Uh, they then decide, well, the tenant's moved out. Well, I'm going to go and clean up the unit and paint the walls. They've just increased the value of a superannuation asset. That's a contribution. It's an ineligible contribution to the fund. It's illegal. So they've just broken the uh, contribution rules of superannuation by cleaning the unit and painting it. Um, if you, particularly if you're from Sydney, um, you're lucky to get a rental yield on anything at much above two and a half to two and three quarter percent gross. If you're over the age of 16, commence a pension. Your maximum, your minimum pension that you must pay to put the fund into pension phase is four percent. So your yield of the property doesn't even cover the minimum pension amount, and that's before you pay um, strata levies and insurances and the other out and uh, tax and accounting and audit fees uh, of the fund. Um, residential property fundamentally is not an investment grade asset class as far as I'm concerned. People buy it because they understand it. They think it goes up a lot. It kind of does, but they don't do what's called a discounted cash flow analysis and understand the bleeding investment that residential property is. Or like and people, so what's that? Anyone ever heard of negative gearing? That means you're losing money every year. And to get that money back with negative gearing, you have to make a profit on the sale. You have to pay capital gains tax on that profit to then get back to 0% return. 
So it's not, for me, it's not really an investment grade asset. You can have it if you want, but it's not an investment grade asset in my mind. So if you must buy residential property, um, I would strongly urge you to do it not inside a self-managed super fund. Because there's, and there's a myriad of other problems with it as well. Yeah, no, I, that, thanks for sharing that, David. I appreciate that wasn't something that was specifically on the list, but the um, the part about painting kind of just blew my mind. <laughs> That's something that you'd think that is so um, benign can be so problematic. I mean, one of the members has now asked, you know, how would you paint it then? Um, you have to you pay know, somebody. You, 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 you have to pay somebody. It. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to basically have to pay a contract painter who's who's at arm's length, so you can't ask your son to go do it or your daughter to go do it. Um, you know, it's 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 got to be done by an unrelated third party, which means you're paying market rates. It's going to cost you more money. Um, you know, and and the, the thing the thing one another takeaway from this, if you, if it hasn't been sort of picked up already, SMSFs are so complex, and when you have related assets that there's so many rules that come across like a mesh across each other and you think, oh, well, that's fine, related party transactions, business real property, that's okay. But then you might be breaching the sole purpose test or you might be breaching contribution rules or you might be breaching transfer balance cap issues or you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that cross over each other and it's only one activity, but it triggers lots of different things and, and that's the bit you've really got to be careful of. Yeah. Thanks, David, for sharing that. I really appreciate you coming in today. Um, it, as I said, it's been a topic that we had um, been people had people, you know, shouting out to to get some guidance on, and breaking it down in that way was so helpful for us to see, you know, what the options are, and and you know, while all of us in this group might not be SMSF specialists, I think the the key takeaways are being aware that there are options and what are they, um, and get engaging with people like yourself early on in the piece so that we can um, give give our clients the most um, information possible so they can make a an educated um, decision about what they want to do with their estate plan. Um, yeah, just as a final comment, I, I would say, um, as inappropriate as it might sound, um, group love is the best thing we can do here. Let's get the right people around your clients from all aspects and, and, and treat it as a joint project where we're all working together for the benefit of the client. Because I certainly don't know all the legal issues. I know a lot, but I don't know all of them. I, I know a lot about taxation, but I don't know all of them. So nobody, and you'll never find anybody that knows everything about everything because th th those people just, it's not possible to be that kind of person. You're either going to be a really good generalist and not an expert, but if you can get the right experts together working for your client and working in a coordinated fashion, like I said, not only do you create the best outcome, but the clients love it. Thanks so much, David. Thanks again for sharing everything with us today. If anybody has any ongoing questions for David or um, wants to reach out to him, um, David will share his contact details. Um, you can approach him on LinkedIn, send us an email to hello at, and we can um, connect you with David. Um, thanks again, David. Um, we hope you have a really great afternoon and um, thanks everybody for, for joining us. Pleasure, Carrie. Thank you. And thank you to you and Tara. Appreciate it.